So, <clears throat> getting into the book of Exodus here, chapter 17, um, something I kind of wanted to do, been thinking about doing, was maybe do a little bit of a series here. In particular, on the person of Joshua, I thought maybe there was a few sermons we could look at and, and uh, just some aspects of Joshua's life, things that we could apply to our own lives. Uh, Joshua, you know, is a great, great example in the Word of God. He's somebody that we can learn a lot from. And, you know, the Bible does have a lot of great godly examples in them. And they're given to us for a reason. And I think that if we take a little time to look at each individual character in the Bible, there would be a lot of things that we could learn about uh, from these people that we could apply to our own lives that would be a help to us. And I think Joshua is one of those people. I mean, Joshua was such a great man of God that he had an entire book named after him. So obviously he's a, you know, a key player in the Old Testament. He's somebody that's very significant in the Old Testament. And uh, that's why I thought it would be good to just look at him and look at some of his traits, some things about Joshua. Because it's important that we look to these examples that we have in Scripture. It's important that we go and look at these characters and see what kind of things we can learn from them. Um, because the fact is, we really don't find cal uh, examples of this caliber in our own lives. That's not to say that we don't have great godly examples, that we don't have good godly Christians, uh, fathers and mothers and fellow Christian laborers, pastors and others that we can look to and, and certainly look to their example as we're admonished to do and, and to follow in their footsteps and follow their lead and learn a lot from them. But we have to remember a lot of times the things that they're teaching us, uh, you know, uh, the leaders and churches, pastors and preachers, is that oftentimes they're turning to examples in Scripture and that's who it is we're really learning from. Yeah. So it's always good to look at these examples because, again, we find many great examples in the Word of God of, of, of people of a very high caliber character, I would say, that we can learn a lot from. And we just, quite frankly, don't have a lot in this modern day, maybe ever, uh, that we can draw from. And that's why I think God gives us these examples. God gives us men in the Bible, ladies in the Bible, that we can look to and that we can learn a lot from. Not to just emulate, emulate what, they are, what they have done. Not just to say I need to be like them. Not to try and do that. That's a good thing to do. But to actually learn from these people and actually try to take the things that made them who they are and weave them into the very character of who we are. Make them part of our own being. Not to just, you know, uh, try to put on a show or, or try to just follow some kind of a habit out of ritual or whatever it might be. But actually learn from them and take these lessons and put them into practice in our life to the point where they become really who we are, what help make us who we are. And really, Joshua is one of the greatest examples that I think we can look to as a leader and, and, and several different things about him, several different roles that uh, Joshua fulfilled in his lifetime that are roles that we as Christians also have to fulfill. And really, the first role I want us to look at tonight in the life of Joshua is Joshua the soldier. Joshua the soldier. Again, Joshua filled a lot of different roles in his life. But the first thing that we see him doing when Joshua first comes on the scene in Scripture, we see Joshua fulfilling the role of a soldier. If you would, look there in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8, where the Bible reads, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses, and Josh, and Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go, fight with, go out fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek and Moses, and with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, uh, <clears throat> they, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. Uh, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So that's the first time we meet Joshua. And what's he doing? He's out soldiering. Not only is he soldiering, but he's actually probably, in all likelihood, a captain, a leader within the army. Yes, a leader, but also one who's actually out there physically fighting the battle. And he sets a very good example for us. And it's something, this is a role as a soldier that we see Joshua fulfilling time and time again in his life. Often there were many battles, of course, we know when they first go in to the promised land, when they cross over Jordan, that it is Joshua that's leading them and leading them in many different battles. And he fought his entire life 
I mean, this wasn't just something that he put his time in for a little while and then retired from. He just didn't go do his tours, as it were, over in Canaan land and then come back and that was it. No, Joshua was a soldier. He was somebody that fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. He was a lifelong soldier. And really, this, this is a, a significant thing. Uh, that, that Joshua shows up as a, as a soldier here in the, in the Scripture. Because we have to remember that Joshua, this isn't like Joshua just appeared out of nowhere. Joshua has been present with Moses, with the children of Israel. He's been traveling along with them out of Egypt, you know, across the Red Sea, and into the wilderness, and wandering around. He's been with them the entire time. But it's not until here where we see Joshua actually go out and fight a battle. It's not until this moment that we see Joshua appear in Scripture. And that in itself is a lesson that we need to learn. That the desire to be recognized is not the motive that we should have. You know, Joshua was greatly and mightily used of God. But, you know, he didn't, he, he didn't go out of his way to try to gain recognition. He didn't go out of his way to try to gain the spotlight. But what, what do we end up, uh, what do we see uh, ended up happening with Joshua? is that eventually, in time, he is put into a very significant position. That in time, he is put in a position of, of leadership and doing mighty, great works for God. But it's not like he just showed, like he started out from day one there. It's not just like he was, uh, in, you know, fighting these great battles from day one and he was the man from day one. He had to put in his time, put in his dues. And we'll talk more about that in later sermons about Joshua. But the lesson is here that we should not desire to be recognized. That is not the motive that we should have as God's people. You know, that type of an attitude, that type of desire to be seen of men is something that Jesus strongly rebuked. It's something he pointed out as a major flaw in the Pharisees. He said that all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. The desire to be seen of men is not something that we should have in our hearts. That is not the proper motive for serving God. And Jesus went on and said, Matthew 23, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You know, that's not to say that if, if you are exalted, or if you are uh, put in a position such as Joshua for leadership, or you have many eyes upon you and people looking to you, that that's a bad thing. But that's something that should kind of come about in and of itself. That's something that should come to you in time. That's not something that people should go out and just try to take prematurely upon themselves. And, you know, we will be acknowledged, of course, you know, perhaps in this life, only after we've been living as we should, only after we've been doing the things that we should and we've been uh, living faithfully. You know, the Bible says that we should be found faithful, that, that a steward must be found faithful. And, you know, it might even be that in this life we are never recognized. It might even be in this life that no one ever says your name from a pulpit. It might, it might be that you're never, you know, on YouTube. All the glory of being on YouTube, <laughs> right? It might be that you're never invited here or invited there. You know, I, I was thinking just recently, I was here, somebody asked me, you know, when are you going to be invited to the conference, one of these conferences to, to preach? I don't know. And my response was, Maybe when they've exhausted all of the resources. <laughs> you know, I can say, honestly, there's a lot of other guys I'd rather hear than me. You know, there's a lot of other preachers I'd, you know. But that, it doesn't bother me. It's not, it's not like I, I cry myself to sleep at night going, oh, why me? Why does he get to go? I mean, that would be, that would be a pretty poor attitude, wouldn't yeah. it? You'd say there is a major problem with Brother Corbin. Yeah. If I was moping around going, why do they get to go to the <laughs> Right? But some people do have this attitude. They desire to be seen of men, they, and they are willing to go to great lengths to do so. They're willing to preach heresy. They're willing to self-ordain. Yeah. They're willing to just sidestep the qualifications of being a bishop just to get a little bit of recognition. And a lot of times, they don't care if it's good or bad recognition. They don't care if their name is said in praise. They don't care if their name is said in derision. They just want to be noticed. It's true. And, you know, that is not the right motive. And you know, it just might be that in this life you are never recognized by man. But you know, make mark it down that one day you will be. That if you are faithful in those things that you ought to be doing, if you're faithful in serving the Lord, that you will be recognized in heaven. And if you know, if, if I were going to be recognized by anybody, 
I mean, would you rather would, would you rather have the praise of man on this earth? Would you rather have you know the 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 hundred likes on on uh, YouTube or whatever? Or would you rather have, hear those words from Jesus Christ Himself? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Right, yeah. I mean that that one statement from the words uh, the, from the mouth of Jesus Christ Himself. That's going to be far more valuable than any recognition anybody could ever get on this earth. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> we might never be acknowledged here, and that's fine. Yeah. We should understand the Bible says that likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. There are the good works that some do here on earth, and they are manifest, they are recognized. We see them here on earth beforehand. And they that are otherwise cannot be hid. They that are otherwise, meaning those that are not manifested before him, cannot be hid. You think, boy, I'm not going to be, I'm not being recognized for all my faithful service. I'm not being recognized for all the things that I do. Maybe not here, but and you feel like it's being hidden, that nobody recognizes it, that nobody sees it. But the Bible says it cannot be hid. What does it mean by that? It means that when you, one day you're going to get to heaven, and it's no longer going to be hidden. Amen. Yeah. That one day. It will be revealed. The Bible says, "Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will bring, uh, who will both bring to the light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God." And God's going to try all all those works. And I think that a lot of people are going to be surprised in heaven. They're going to see somebody. You're going to think, "Boy, surely this guy, he's just been on fire. He's done this. He's done that, and he's got a lot of recognition down here." But if his heart is wrong, for the wrong reasons, you know, all those works are going to be burned up. Those if he has the wrong motive, it's gone. And you know what, I think there's going to be a lot of people that nobody knows about. I think there's going to be, especially, I think, a lot of mothers, a lot of ladies yeah. who have just been quietly laboring in the background, raising godly children, yeah. teaching godly children, supporting their husbands, you know, being obedient to the Word of God that nobody knows about, nobody recognizes, that God is going to highly exalt one day. Amen. <clears throat> And it could be you. Even you in this room tonight, you feel like no one notices, no one recognizes me, no one knows what I'm doing. Good. That's, that's good. That's a good thing. Because your heart isn't going to get puffed up. You're not going to be lifted up with pride. Hopefully, you know, in all likelihood. When people start to praise you, and the Bible says, woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. That's not good. I mean, we got to be careful. I'm not saying that we can't enjoy a compliment from somebody. Somebody appreciates something we did. They say a nice comment. That's, that's great. That's encouraging. But we don't need to, to go about feeling like everyone needs to know everything we do so that we can receive the praise of men. The Bible says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And really, that's exactly what we see here with Joshua. He's somebody that's been with them for a long time. We've never heard from him. We don't. And all of a sudden, he shows up in Scripture. And what's he doing? He's in a battle. He's leading God's army. Meaning this, that he's gone through the camp. You know, he went through the training. He's, he's proven himself as a soldier. He's been exalted. And only then and only after that as, as, as he's been found faithful is he then lifted and exalted and given this place in Scripture. We have to humble ourselves in the mighty hand of God and let him exalt us in due time. And realize that like Joshua, who was a soldier, that in the meantime, while we're humbly, quietly, privately serving God, unrecognized, unacknowledged by man, that in the meantime, while we're doing that, we still have an enemy to face. And that's why we need to take note of somebody like Joshua and understand the importance of being a soldier. The Bible says in 1 Peter, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, who resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We still have an enemy to face. And people get so caught up worrying about Who's going to recognize them? Who's going to say their name? When they're going to be exalted to some position? And they forget and they get so caught up in sometimes in just trying to get the glory for men that they don't realize that there's an enemy that they have to fight. So, so that's why it's real important that we understand that we need to be like Joshua in the sense that Joshua was a soldier. That's a big part of the Christian life. Being a soldier spiritually, of course, I'm not suggesting any of you go... Uh, go out and sign up to, uh, to the U.S. military, and you know, and, and get in the ranks along some sodomite. Right. They just let them in, apparently. You know, or, or go out and have them slap the U.N. helmet on you and, and do who knows what. Yeah. 
But I'm saying that we should be a soldier spiritually today because we have a spiritual enemy. We have somebody that's going to resist us, somebody that's going, we have an adversary, the devil, who is walking about, at, you know, seeking whom he may devour. And it might be that he has his eyes on you or someone near you. And being a soldier is a major aspect of the Christian life. Go ahead and turn over to uh, turn over to Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six. The Bible talks a lot about being a soldier. In the New Testament, we have several different passages that liken us as Christians unto soldiers. We have a man named Joshua in the Old Testament that is given that spotlight, that is given uh, to us as an example, and what was he? What did we find him as in, when he first comes on in the scene? We find him as a soldier. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So that's a big part. I mean, he's saying, look, Paul's telling Timothy here, you need to endure hardness as a soldier. You need to have the mentality of a soldier. You have to have the, the grit and the will and the fortitude of somebody that would be in a battle. Because if we lack those things, if we're unwilling to endure hardness, if we don't want to be a good soldier, if we want to allow ourselves to be entangled with affairs of this life, we're going to find ourselves defeated. We're going to find ourselves being attacked. We're going to find ourselves, you know, dead in the foxhole somewhere someday. You know, we're going to be a casualty of war. And that's not something that any of us would want. Look there in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, Finally, my brethren, verse 10, Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the of this darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Wherefore, take on you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day and having to done all to stand. I mean, it sounds like we've got a pretty serious adversary. To me, it sounds like being a soldier is a major part of the Christian life. To me, it sounds like this is something that we have to get a hold of and understand because we have an enemy. That we have somebody that wants to fight us as, a, as on a battlefield. Someone that's warring against us. And it requires us to be soldiers. You know, and this is something, you know, we find Joshua first, the first time we see Joshua in Scripture, we see him as a soldier. And in the same way, we too, even when we are first saved, we are immediately thrust into a battle. Yeah. It, you know, this, we're not, we didn't involve ourselves in a Sunday school picnic. That's not what the Christian life is. Right. You know, it, it's a, as the song goes, you know, the, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Yeah. Amen. And that's what we're in. We're, we've involved our... If you've gotten saved, guess what? You, you got signed up here on the front line so, for the Lord. And a lot of people don't realize that. And sometimes it takes people... First, they have to get shot at a few times. They hear a few <laughs> bullets whiz by. Maybe they get clipped in the arm. They find themselves you know, being tended to by some medic. You know, they find them back in the barracks, you know, in God's house, trying to fix themselves, trying to fix their life. And, and someone has to tell them, Yeah, duh, you were out in the battle. You are out involved in a fight. That's what the Christian life is. It's a battle. It's a fight. And we need to realize that. And the sooner the better. I mean, the first time we see Joshua, it's a soldier. And if we get saved, we are too are immediately thrust into the battle. Well, why is it? Why is it that it doesn't seem fair? Why would you take somebody who's just new to the faith and say that they're immediately thrust into the battle? Because Satan attacks early. Satan is somebody who knows that if he strikes... You know, early on and fast and hard, that he can win. A lot of times, that's that, that's who you see get taken out. A lot of times, it's the Christians who are new to the faith, yeah. those that are don't understand perhaps the, uh, the the fullness of what they're involved in, the spiritual battle that they're involved in. We don't understand the attacks that Satan has. They're weak. They're vulnerable. I mean, he's as a as a roaring lion. You watch lions hunt; they don't go after the biggest, the baddest. You know, an animal in the pack. They go after the weak of the herd. They go after the, the young. They go after those that haven't gained strength. So it's important for us to learn early on that being a soldier is a major uh, part of the Christian life. That having that soldier like mentality, of having a mentality that's saying, I'm willing to endure hardness. I'm willing to go to war and not be entangled with the affairs of this life. 
one of the aspects you would look at in a soldier is a soldier is somebody who takes orders. A soldier is somebody who is subservient to higher orders. He's somebody that has a higher power over him, and the orders come down from above, and what he's told to do, that's what he does. And when soldiers do that, when they follow orders, if they have a good general, if they have a good captain, generally speaking, they're going to win. Or they're going to suffer uh, far less casualties than they otherwise would. And it's important that we understand that that's what we need to do. We need to learn to submit ourselves, the Bible says, to God and resist the devil. And that's a conflict. But if we're willing to do that, if we're willing to submit and to resist, the Bible says that the devil will flee from us. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want the devil around. I'd rather get some distance between me and Satan. Yeah. I'd rather see him flee. And the devil doesn't want you to realize this. He doesn't want you to know that if you would just resist him and flee him. I mean, there's, you know, there's only so many devils in this world. You know, when, when Satan, when, they, when he took one-third of the angels with him, you know, they're, they're, there's, they have limited numbers. Right? I believe there's quite a few. But they can't waste their time on somebody whom they know they can't get to. They're not going to sit there and waste their time on somebody who they know is steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the Word of the Lord. If they see somebody who's consistently resisting them, if they see a good soldier who is enduring a hardness, who's uh, warring the, and, and fighting and not giving in, they're going to say they're going to move on to somebody else. And they're going to go pick on that guy. Not to say he might not come around later and test your metal again, see what you're made of, and see if he can't try something else to get you. But I believe that when the devil comes up against us and we resist him, the Bible says that he flees. And he goes somewhere else and tries to get somebody else. And we're involved in a spiritual fight here, make no doubt about it. And we have, you know, we say, well, I'm not sure that I like the idea of the fact that we're involved in the fight. Nobody likes confrontation, usually. I know I don't. I'm not a big fan of, of confrontation. I like to be at peace and just kind of maybe a little too much, maybe a little too easygoing. But it's really something, I mean, to think that we have the opportunity to see God fight for us. If to see God fight for us as we battle, you know, we get involved in these fights and, and we look to God to help us, to, to encourage us, to strengthen us. And God will, will come to our aid and He will help us, just as He did with Joshua. I mean, what an amazing thing that Joshua got to come back and smite, I mean, he, you know, smote the Amalekites and comes back and tells them what happened up on the mountain. Yeah, every time Moses' arms dropped, you guys lost. But when we held them up, they won. I mean, that's an act of God. I mean, what what specific you know what specific uh, strategy did the, does that make? You know, what difference does that make on the battlefield? Whether Moses' arms are like this or like this, there's no strategic benefit. I mean, it's not you know it doesn't make any sense. It's an act of God. It's something to show you that God is the one that's involved here. Right. And then when the man of God's arms are up, God moves. And when they're down, God doesn't. God isn't fighting. And I think he allowed that to happen just to show them that the battle is the Lord's. Amen. And what an amazing thing that Joshua got to even be involved in so many of those battles. We think, of, of course, in Joshua, if you would turn over to Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. I mean, here's an amazing battle. You say, I don't know if I like fighting. I don't know if I want to get involved in a fight. Well, you know what? Some guys, some guys kind of get into that. I mean... Being in a fight, being in a battle, I mean, it's exciting at least, isn't it? I mean, there's some, there's, at least there's a, an element of danger. I mean, I think about this camping trip that we're going on. Bears. <laughs> cougars. You know, I, maybe I shouldn't spill the beans here and scare anybody off, but uh, Brother uh, Geronimo was telling me he's been up here on Mount Lemon camping, and he heard scratching one night on his tent, and he went out and opened it up, and a black bear and her mother uh, and her baby uh, cubs we're getting into the coolers. I mean, that's where we're going. We're gonna go up there and we're gonna we're gonna camp out right with them bears. I mean, that's exciting. So I mean, if you don't like conflict, you know, you're not gonna like the Christian life. And I'll tell you what, there's plenty of other churches where you can go, and they're not gonna say anything con uh, con uh, controversial. They're not gonna say anything, you know, that might get you in hot water with the media. They're not gonna say anything that's gonna have to cause you to make a decision in your life about the way you're going to live. They're not going to say anything that's going to upset you. They're not going to rock the boat. And you can have a nice, quiet, plain, boring Christian life. You know why a lot of people come to Faithful Word? It's because it's exciting. Amen. They're excited about it. 
to see somebody stand up and preach hard in the Word of God and take it to them. Not just be on the defense all the time. Not just be running and cowering and hiding, but actually going on the offense and fighting back. It's exciting. And if we're going to be like Joshua and be a soldier, we have the opportunity to see God fight for us just as Joshua did. It says there in Joshua 10, verse 1, Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king. So had he had done to Ai and her king and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. That, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore Adonai, Adonai, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Jephiah, king of Lachish, and unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me, and help me, that we may spite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Notice he didn't say, Help me go fight Joshua. Help me go fight Israel. He wanted to go pick on somebody that he, think he thought he could win. And that's just like the devil. <laughs> you know, he's not always going to take you head on if he knows that you're strong in the faith. You know, he, but he might go somebody after somebody in your family. Yeah. He might go after a child. He might go after a spouse. He might try and fight the, 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 leak, the, the weak link in your family and go after it. Yeah. And that's kind of what these guys are doing here. The problem isn't the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites aren't beating anybody. They, they, they were this close to getting wiped out. The problem is Joshua and Israel, but these guys don't want to fight him. They want to go fight the Gibeonites. Therefore, the five kings of Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, and all their hosts, and camped before Gibeon, and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon said unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thine hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. And, when, and, and there shall not a man uh, of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came suddenly and went up from Gilgal at night. And the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a the great slaughter at Gibeon and chased along, them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon, and smote them to Azekah, and unto Makeda. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down of Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. And there were more that died, uh, which died with hailstones, than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord, uh, when the Lord delivered up the Amorites, before them, uh, before the children of Israel, and said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of uh, Ajalon. And the, stun, the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, unto the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. I mean, that's an amazing story. We just read over those words and tell us some tough names in there. Do you really understand what took place here? I mean, God is sending down great hailstones from heaven. He's killing more people with the hailstones than the children of Israel can kill with the sword. I mean, he's fighting on behalf of God's people to the point where he's even hearkening unto the voice of a man, to the point where he's saying, I'll even stop the sun and the moon to help you win this fight. I mean, that's the same God that we serve. Amen. That's our God. That's the same God that we have today. That's right. That's willing to fight on our behalf. I mean, and you know, that's that's a that's a small thing to God to do these things. It's nothing to him. Yep. And he Joshua got to see all of this. You know, Joshua had the opportunity to see God fight for him. Why? Because he's willing to get in the battle as a soldier. And that's what we need to learn from Joshua tonight, is that we too need to be soldiers. And not be so worried about what people are going to think or say, or, or when we're going to get acknowledged, or when somebody's going to you know, uh, lift us up or some, to some place. But just steadily be faithful to God and do the work and fight day in and day out and, do, and fight the battle. And if we're willing to do that, 
then we're going to see God fight. We're going to see God work on our behalf. And Joshua got to see that, but none of that would have happened if Joshua had not endured the hardness at the very beginning of the story. I mean, we like that latter half. We like the part about the sun standing still, the moon standing still, the hailstones coming down, and God fighting, and there being no day like that. I mean, it's a powerful passage. But none of that would have happened if Joshua hadn't learned to endure hardness at the very beginning. Look at verse 7 there. The Gibeonites, of course, call out to him, say, come up and help us. And it says in verse 7, so Joshua ascended from Gilgal. Ascended. That means going up, right? I was thinking about today we're out soul winning at those apartments. There was some ascending going on. Yeah. <laughs> Three stories. And I had to go dun 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 get to that third floor because that's where we started. And you know, I really like the ones where you go all the way to the top and then the door, the first door is immediately right there. So you're like, oh, and it's time to knock. And, you know, and they come to the door, you're like, my neighbor. <laughs> Maybe you guys don't have a problem. <laughs> I did. But I mean, ascending isn't easy, is it? That's the point. Ascending isn't, so if I were to tell you, hey, we're going to go camping up at 7,700 feet, or uh, 7,700 feet elevation this July, but no cars are allowed. You know, that sign-up sheet would probably remain blank. Who's going to want to go on a 7,000 height? I mean, some of us might. Some, yeah, I can, I can think of, there's probably a few of you that would, right? But by and large, we, we probably prefer to just drive up there. Because ascending isn't something that's easy to do. And that's what Joshua had to do. If he was going to go see God work on his behalf, if he was going to go deliver these people, and if he was going to see this great day that, you know, there was no day like it before it or after it, that a man hearkened on the voice of God, it started with some, some hardness. It started with him having to ascend from Gilgal. He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty man of valor. You know, a lot of times, the Christian life, it seems like an uphill battle. It seems like everybody's against us. You know, the heathen are raging, the media is against us, you know, they're sending their nasty messages, you know, the family doesn't understand why you're going to that church, you know, and then you've got to actually live the Christian life, which isn't the easiest thing to do. You know, you have to, you know, beat your body under, bring it into subjection. You have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's hard work to do that, right. to, yeah. to live for Christ and do the things that we ought to do. And sometimes it just seems like it's an uphill battle. You know why it seems like an uphill battle? Because it is. Because it is an uphill battle. And it's going to be an uphill battle all the way. And, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat it and make I mean, just say, oh, the Christian life is easy and don't worry, you know, there's going to be a plateau. There probably isn't. It's, I mean, things will, will get stronger along the way. And yes, it'll probably be easier to do those hard and difficult things. And it won't become such a shock to us when, when certain things happen. But it's still going to be an uphill struggle. It's still going to be the next battle, and then the next battle, and then the next battle, and then the next battle of having to die daily. It's an uphill battle because the Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness. I mean, I'm looking around, there's over a million people in this city, and they're not beating down the door to get in here and sit down and hear what some Baptist preacher has to say. They lie in wickedness today. And it's our job to call out that wickedness and to separate ourselves from that wickedness. Yep. And that's a battle, friend. That is a separation. That is saying, we're going to be different from you. We're not going to go along with you. We're going to resist that and not have anything to do with it. The Bible says that in the last day, days, perilous times shall come. It says that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. And that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's an uphill battle. That's why it feels like an uphill battle. Because it is. But here's the thing. God will help us if we'll just take that first step. I mean, God didn't work on, on, on Joshua's behalf until he got in the thick of it. Until he got into that battle. And if Joshua had said, you know, I know they want us to go and help them, and maybe we would if it was a descent instead of an ascent, but sometimes if we'll just you know, say that difficult first step, if we'll just take that difficult first step in the right direction, God will start to move and work on our behalf. Look there in verse 7. It says, So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them in their hand, 
there shall not a man of them stand before thee. He takes that first step. He starts going out. He starts ascending. And immediately God comes to his aid and says, Fear them not. And immediately comes to him and says, I have delivered them into thine hand. I have to imagine that that ascent up to Gilgal was probably a little bit easier knowing that he had the promise of God. That when he got there, it was showtime. That when he got there, it was going to go down. And that he was going to be coming out on the other side, a conqueror, a victor. And that's the same thing for us. Yes, it's going to be an uphill battle all the way to the end of this life. It's going to be a fight and a fight and then another fight and another fight. It's going to be an ascent all the way. But I'm telling you what, when we get to the other side, when we get to glory, we're going to come out the victors. Amen. We're the ones who are going to come out more than conquerors through him that loved us. Yeah. Kings and priests of our God. <clears throat> I have to imagine when, when he got that, that promise there, when he told him, fear not, that that probably really boosted his morale. You know, that, that's the thing. We can really endure some hardness if our morale is high. I mean, that's the, one of the big things in the military. They, morale is incredibly important and you have to keep the morale of the troops up because battle is hard because battle they have enough difficulty you know their lives are on the line many times and they have to go out they have to do a very difficult job and it, it makes it a little bit easier if their morale is up if they feel like there's a point to it or that they have help if there's going to be some assurity of victory on the other side and they can endure a little bit more and you say good night it was an uphill hike for him. He had to go out and go ascend to Gilgal. Well, that's not the worst of it. It got a little bit harder after that. Look at verse 9. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. Now, I don't think he was, you know, when, they, when, the, when the call came down from Gilgal, hey, come up and help us. When the Gibeonites were saying, you need to come get up here. You know, that came to him during the day that he was probably just laying around taking it easy. He was probably working doing what he needed to do, probably maybe even looking forward to a good night's rest. And this call comes down, and he doesn't say, well, we'll get there tomorrow. Well, we'll let us sleep. You know, he immediately goes out and he goes, all night. <clears throat> when our morale is high, we say, man, we can, we can endure a little bit more. When we know we have the promise of God with us, we know that we can endure even a little bit more hardness. I mean, yeah, it's an uphill battle, but also you're going to do it all night when you'd rather be in your bed sleeping. You'd rather be resting. And we got a lot of Baptists today. They're not going to deny the fact that there is a battle. They're not going to deny the fact that the devil is raging. They're not going to deny the fact that there's a need for us to stand up and fight. But they'll do it tomorrow. But they'll do it when it's a little bit easier. When we can see what we're doing. When it's a little bit easier to see how to get there. It's just a little too dark right now. That, that's a poor attitude. And you're not going to get anything accomplished that way. And you're going to end up defeated. And you're certainly not going to see God fight on your behalf. So it's important that we understand the insignificance of Joshua showing up in Scripture the first time we see him as a soldier. Because that is the example that we have to have in this Christian life. Uh, that is the example we are given in this Christian life. And it's something that we have to make a part of our Christian life. The fact that Christian life is, is a fight, that it is a battle, that it's an uphill battle, and that it's in the dark, and that it's not going to be easy. But here's the encouraging thing. No man should be able to stand against thee. God's going to fight for us. In the end, we know who's going to win. Yeah. And really, a soldier's life, if you think about it, a soldier's life is summed up in two words. One of two words. Victory or defeat. I mean, that's really the only two things a soldier would really know. How did the battle win go? Well, you either won or you lost. Somebody always wins and somebody always loses. And that's how a soldier's life really is summed up in one of those two words, victory or defeat. And you can't oh, go into every battle. I mean, you think about it on this earth. They go into battle here, literal soldiers. They don't always know what the outcome's going to be. I mean, if you're fighting the United States military, you probably know what the outcome's going to be. Right? Because it's the beast. You know, nobody able to make war with the beast. Right. And it's, it's the most powerful military force the world has ever known. All right? But generally speaking, I mean, in Joshua's... And in Joshua's day, when kings would gather to go out to, to fight, they didn't always know who was going to win. You didn't know if you were going to come home, what kind of shape you were going to be in, if you made it at all. The outcome is not determined, determined until that war is over. But the good news about for us 
yeah. as soldiers spiritually is that we already know how this ends. Yeah. We already know how this battle ends spiritually. Yeah. I mean, it's dark now. The world lies in wickedness. It's an uphill battle, but we at least have the comfort and assurance of knowing how this ends. <clears throat> and we know how this ends spiritually. I mean, if you would, if you, in two, one of two ways, we know how it ends spiritually. If you would, turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. We already know how this fight's going to end spiritually. Because we're involved in a spiritual fight. A spiritual battle for the hearts and, and the souls of men. That they would see and understand the gospel, that they would hear it and know the truth. Uh, that, uh, that Jesus Christ loves them and died for them, that their sins can be forgiven, and that there's a hell to be avoided and a heaven to gain. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead uh, shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through, Jesus, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We know one day that death itself is going to be swallowed up. And that it's the last enemy that shall be defeated is death. And that death shall have no more dominion. And when we know how we're going to win this spiritual battle, that the outcome is ours, that we're already victors in Christ. But we also know how this ends on earth physically. We talk about the spiritual battle, and that's the major component. And obviously... We're not fighting a physical battle right now. You know, God hasn't called us to go out and try to overturn governments and enact, you know, you know, a, a theocratic law where we're going to, you know, God will take care of that in due time. This, but we already know how it's going to end physically. Go ahead and turn over to Revelation chapter 19. I think sometimes we don't understand uh, the fullness of what it is God's going to do physically on this earth. I mean, there's a physical battle that's going to be fought against the enemy, and be won as well. And the, the point I'm trying to make is that we already have the comfort of knowing how it ends. Therefore, it makes it so much easier for us to endure hardness. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power in the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments. For he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Look at verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called Faithful and the True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp two-edged sword, that, it should, uh, that, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his name uh, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against them, him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. And him with the false, and within the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he had, with which he deceived them, they received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These were both cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with fire, of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. 
and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And that's <laughs> that's the end of the wicked in this world. That is the I mean the, the that army that follows him on white horses, clothed in fine linen. That's me and you. Yep. <laughs> that's our captain. We Amen. see that battle take place. Right. That's amazing. And we already know how this is going to end here on this earth spiritually. We already know that we already have the victory over death and the grave, that it has no more dominion over us. And we already know how this battle is going to end one day even physically. That God, I mean, that God just makes it sound so easy because it is for Him. Amen. He just takes Him, casts Him right in a lake of fire as if there are nothing. And that entire army, do you notice we're there, but we don't do any fighting. <laughs> he just with the sword of His mouth, just the word of His mouth, and all the birds come and just eat their flesh. Right. Amen. Joshua didn't have any doubts about his God. And therefore he fought. I mean, Joshua left Gilgal and God had gave him that assurance that he was going to be with him and that he was going to fight him and that no man would be able to stand before him. And he was able to endure that hardness and he had no doubts about the God that he was serving. And I just wonder sometimes, do we have that same unwavering faith? Or do we sometimes doubt if God's really going to come through. Is this really going to end well for us? You know, and when it's people that have that lack of faith, they're the ones that get out of the battle. They're the ones that have that unwillingness to fight. You see, an unwillingness to fight, that's a lack of faith. To say, I don't, you know, I don't want to get in the battle. I, I don't know how it's going to turn out. Well, that's a lack of faith. <clears throat> the Bible says, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We've already won the fight. It's already done. This battle, we already know how it ends. And we should just learn to be like Joshua. Joshua is somebody who shows up in Scripture as a soldier, leading the battle. That's, like, that's, that's a big part of the Christian life, learning how to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. But that wasn't the only aspect of Joshua's character. I mean, that was a big part of it. That's a big part of the Christian life, is learning to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, but learning that this is, a, this is a battle that we're involved in, and that we have to endure and fight and, and look to God to, to come to our aid. But it isn't the only aspect. And it's not the only aspect of Joshua's character either. And really, as I think when we look at other aspects of Joshua's character, what we're going to see is it's what he did off the battlefield that made him great. That made him a, a real mighty man of God. Because, you know, soldiering isn't the only part of the Christian life. There's a lot more to it. It's a major one, but there are a lot of other things that we need to learn in order to make us a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And that's what we'll see as we continue to look at Joshua. That Yes, he was a great soldier who saw great victories and saw God work mightily, but there were a lot of other things that Joshua did off the battlefield that made him a great soldier and a mighty man of God. Let's go ahead and pray.